All right. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, welcome to what is my first ever Zoom presentation. So I'm kind of hoping that the technology doesn't outwit me at some stage as we keep going uh, through this. Hopefully everyone's had a fairly constructive day. Beer comments already flying in there. Yep, multiple beer comments. Um, little intro to me, for those people that don't know me, uh, I'm the chief instructor of Skardav Langer. I've been uh, chief instructor there for the last 12 years. A lot of the stuff that I'll do on an annual basis includes things like safety days. And so I was asked to just get involved and do a, a very brief talk here before the season really sort of starts. Um, it's going to be a fairly quick session. I'm probably going to do 20 or 30 minutes, I would think. And then there'll be opportunity for people to ask questions at the end if they wish. There are a few links in here to some YouTube footage and to some tutorials as we go. They'll also all be available in the chat and in the details afterwards as well. So um, if you don't get them at the time, don't worry about it. We will cycle back to those and uh, uh, you'll be able to get access, hopefully, to the video clips and stuff that uh, I'm using. So basically, uh, the aim of this session really is just to give you some prompts, some ideas, uh, some things to consider out uh, what we're going to do before we actually start our jump season. Without a doubt, at some stage, we're going to be able to reopen. And based on last year, uh, when we did open, we were intensely busy at Langer. Um, we did a lot of jumps. September was the busiest September for Skylab Langer um, in its history. Uh, so I can think, I would think that this year we're likely to see quite a lot of activity when we start. Mm. So really the aim of this is to get you to think about what we need to do beforehand, what we need to do to get ourselves prepared and ready. Such a strange year with 2020, most of us, and that certainly includes me, are going to start the 2021 season with less jumps than we'd ever have planned or, or ever have expected. And although we can't jump now, there are certainly a lot of things that we can do in lockdown and indeed make a positive utilization of the lockdown period uh, to help us in, in our start of the skydive season. For sure at the moment, most of us can't use our kit or we can't go jumping. We can't attend a parachute center or a drop zone. Um, so that gives us the opportunity, for example, to have our gear intentionally offline and maybe use the time to have a look at it and see if it needs anything. Our gear saves our lives every time we jump. It's important to us. In order for it to work reliably, then it needs to be well maintained. It needs to be in good condition. So over the years at Langer, we've seen regularly seen malfunctions that are purely gear related. We see silly stuff where kill lines break, uh, or we see people losing their helmets or their camera equipment during a jump. And a lot of this is purely due to the maintenance and the, the routines that they're using with their kit. We've got the opportunity now to resolve a lot of those things before we even start. Just a simple brake fire, for example, uh, can put you in a situation where you've got rotational problems and then you end up having to cut away and use the reserve. So a little bit of time at the moment will help you uh, work through and in the future be safer for this year. What else do we need to do? I'm expecting quite a broad range of qualified people to be listening to this. There could be people right uh, back at the early stages, maybe even if you're a student here, um, early A license, right through to some people with a vast amount of experience. So I'll try and open it up to the, all of you. If you're a student and you come across ideas that may be different to what you've already previously been taught, always see an instructor before you plan to change or introduce new ideas to the way you use equipment or the way you deal with situations. Um, the one thing with the Zoom meeting and the, the distance learning that we're doing at the moment is there is that lack of question and, and answer interaction. So remember for you guys, when you start the jump program again, go and see your instructors. There'll be an element of refresh training that will be working with you anyway, but do make sure that you're up to speed with everything that you're doing. Don't change things over this offline period uh, that could cause problems later on. 
Do we need to freshen up our packing skills? So many malfunctions occur due to packing. Um, I've been presented with comments after a malfunction, after someone's landed safely, uh, where they've said to me, yeah, it, you know, it didn't look right when I put it in the container. And when I closed it up, those lines, I don't know. Um, comments like, yeah, I shouldn't have packed it in the kitchen. Uh, I, that wasn't going to work, was it? You know, packing is really significant. There are various estimations, but if we could all pack perfectly, probably about 80 to 90% of our malfunctions would just disappear. Now, we can assume that no one's ever going to be packing perfectly all the time, but we can remove a vast amount of the situations that we have just through being refreshed or, or taking our time with the packing. The second component is you and your processes. Uh, the way we deal with incidents, the way we deal with malfunctions is vital for our safety. So the first question is, is your gear ready to go? The second question really is, is your brain ready for this? Have you switched off for six months? Have you not jumped for quite a while? Have you been busy with other aspects of life? Lockdown has without a doubt changed the way we approach uh, our daily routines and our lives. Do we need to just remind ourselves about skydiving uh, and how to approach it before we go and turn up at a drop zone or get in an airplane? So gear talk, let me just move the pictures of me so I can actually see my screens. There we go. Um, what do we need to think about with our gear? Firstly, really what I'm suggesting here is don't leave everything to the last minute. Um, without a doubt, you'll, if you own equipment, you'll certainly need a reserve repack. If we consider that we've just seen from the AGM last year, there were 4,000 full members of the BPA or British skydiving as it is now, that could be a lot of reserves for people to have to repack. So think ahead. Do you need to take your kit to a rigger now or in the next two to four weeks? Do you need to send it to them, find ways of, of leaving it at a drop zone or with that person? Rather than potentially if we are reopening in the middle of March, the two weeks beforehand. I know without a doubt that of all our equipment, we came out of lockdown on the 4th of July. The pre previous few weeks, as we ran up to that, most of our center equipment was packed. That means that most of our center equipment went out of date in December. It's currently sitting out of date. And when we look to a restarting program, there's going to be quite a heavy commitment needed from the reserve packers to get our gear in, in order. So if you own parachute equipment, first and basic stuff, you know, try not to leave it till the last two weeks and then hope that your reserve repacker will be packing 100 reserves that week. Um, because the, there's no doubt going to be people that um, find that they can't get a reserve repacked um, in a, a condensed period of time. Your AAD needs servicing occasionally. Um, if you own a Cypress made by Airtech, then it's either four or five years um, for a service. Do you need to send it away? Um, an Airtech Cypress has a, a year window for its AAD service. Um, so it's probably open right now. If you're going to send an AAD away, now's the time to do it. Um, even leaving it three or four weeks from now means that it, it won't be online for when we start the jump season. So when does your AAD require a service? What does it need to be done? What actions do you need to take now or, or even you know, in, in the next week to make sure that it's done? Will your kit survive the season? How much does it need to be prepared, ready for what's coming up? Um, so it's also a great opportunity to have a look at those components that just occasionally need work. Um, I've relined one of my sets of kit in the last couple of weeks. My next one, I have the line set already. I'm about to do that next week. I relined a colleague's um, main parachute last week as well. So um, it's well worth getting those things done now rather than being presented with issues perhaps in June or July when we're busy um, operating and, and actually being able to skydive. If you're going to take your kit offline, you might as well do it now during lockdown. Have a look at your kit. This is something that I get asked quite a bit. It's 
can you come and look at my gear? Can you look at this, that, and the other? So what I'm going to go through now, just over the next few minutes, is just a simple inspection technique that you can use for your own parachute. Now, this can be done, again, at home in a lockdown situation. Find a little bit of space. It doesn't need to be spread out like an inflated parachute. You can just work through the components bit by bit. It doesn't really matter which way you go. I generally start at the the top end, the pilot chute end, but you could equally start at the container end and, and work your way back towards the pilot chute. Have a look at the kit. The pilot chute's the bit that pretty much hits the airflow at 120 miles an hour on almost every jump. It's the bit that has to do its job. Um, I know of at least one situation where someone initiated a deployment and much to their surprise found the, the toggle bit in their hand completely detached from the pilot chute. Fortunately, they'd actually pulled it out of the pocket enough for a normal deployment to occur, but they seemed remarkably surprised that this had detached. Clearly, it had not decayed or, or detached over one jump. It had been working its way that way. So have a good look. Is that bit attached to where it should be? We shouldn't have loose stitching. We shouldn't have tears and holes in the top of our pilot chute. Fabric netting that wears and ages, especially these days when we have very tightly contained parachute systems, the pilot chute's reliant on overcoming that security and pulling the parachute away from us to deploy. Bridle line, kill line, have a look down the length of the bridle line. Is everything secure and attached? Have we got the attachment points where it meets the bag? That's a very big wear point. We see situations where there's a lot of damage at that end, and that's often concealed around the grommet of the deployment bag. So have, they're the sort of areas to have a, a good look and poke around and, and see if they're okay. It's not that long ago when someone on the flight line uh, was having a gear check, and all credit to the person who was doing the check, they called me over and said, look at this. And we found that the closing pin was barely attached to the bridle line. They were very much in risk of throwing the pilot chute and simply retaining the pin in its closing loop and, and having a, a very effective pilot chute in tow. There's an example where a little bit of fraying thread had just been allowed to continue and continue and continue. That had not happened over one or two jumps. That was a situation that had been progressively appearing over maybe 20 or 25 jumps. So have a good look at it, see what the state of your kit is. The deployment bag takes quite a lot of wear and tear. The grommets in particular, the areas where the elastics are stowed are the two areas that are probably worth having a good look at. Look at. A little bit of stitching, again, it's a, a relatively simple job, but can make a lot more security. So have a good look at your kit. People ask me to look at holes, tears, marks in parachutes, uh, and also often uh, for a commentary on the the state of their lines, their general condition and so on. It can be tricky to judge um, how long a line set will last. It varies not just on the type of line or the amount of jumps it's done, but very much on the type of jumps you're doing, the deployment speeds, the, the way you deploy your body position and those sort of things can affect an uneven deployment, can overload some lines. So it can be a tough call looking at those. Fabric side of things, really you don't want a lot of holes in a parachute system. Um, most generally, I'll just simply say a, a, a rule of thumb or a, a little finger. If you can get your little finger through a hole, then you're probably at a point where it's worth patching. If it's smaller than that, and in particular, if it looks more like you think it's just a, a puncture wound to the fabric rather than to a, a progressive stress point, just put a, a pen mark around it put a little date next to it and you can continuously observe just to make sure that that isn't decaying, the hole isn't getting bigger. You've got that measurement point both from a, a timestamp as well as from a, a size. When you're drawing on parachutes, just bear in mind that parachute fabric is not particularly fond of um, anything with any acid in. So you want to make sure that you've got a water-based or a very neutral pen at that stage. Have a good look at the canopy. Just have a little look through. If you've got snags, tears, it's probably worth doing at this time rather than later on. Bottom end, your risers. In particular, we see brake fires. Um, make sure that your steering toggles are securely attached to the risers. 
If there's any damage here, now's the time to get it fixed and have a look at it. Sliders, another area where we see the drawstrings in particular um, wearing or the tunnels in which they're stowed. Um, easily worth just having a quick look at those and whether we need to do a little bit of work. So a general look at the equipment. Finally, at the bottom end, uh, BOC pockets primarily. We see a lot less Velcro on equipment these days, but things like securing your steering toggles is vital. And that's a continuous wear point. Maybe riser covers are a wear point. Leg strap bungee I've put on there. You very regularly will see people with an articulated harness. So just to help people in the description, some people will have metal rings located at the hip points of their equipment, which allows the leg straps to move around a little bit more freely. The downside to that is they can move more freely in situations where you don't want them to move. They can slide around your torso or around your legs in a way that you perhaps won't want to, at various times. So they are secured together with a, with a piece of elastic that holds them in position and allows a little bit of movement whilst you're skydiving, but then will pull them, withdraw them back to where they should be. I'll see quite often um, a pull-up just popped in place. The pull-up will only do half a job. It will limit how far a leg strap can move away from the other one, but it won't then draw it back. And every time you bring that gap closer together, bringing your legs together, you're creating a loop of excess. Uh, you're creating slack. I saw a gentleman three or four years ago on the flight line. He tied a pull-up in there. He'd actually left beyond the knot quite a lot of excess as well. And I wasn't happy with that. I said, all right, let's just get a couple of pair of scissors, cut the excess off at least, because if that goes in your hand during deployment, you're going to get stuck. He immediately turned around with a smile and went, you know what? Two weeks ago, I tried to deploy. I pulled the pilot chute about 15 centimeters out and I couldn't pull it. it was something was stopping me and I kept pulling and I got quite panicked about it. And then it, then I could deploy and he said, I bet I had hold of that. So we can do little things. A leg strap bungee costs about 99p. 44 four mil bungee cord off eBay, half a meter. Two or three of you, if you really want to, can team together and spend two pounds. And then you've got enough for seven or eight sets. So it's well worth just working through these little bits. Um, everyone should have top kit ready for the season. Stuff to help you. Uh, there's lots of checklists out there. The USPA do a nice checklist for equipment uh, as part of their safety day. Um, this is one I just picked straight up off the internet with a quick Google search. Uh, it's the, the NZ uh, Parachute Industries one. And there's quite a nice list of things to look at on the equipment. There's also then further stuff to think about in terms of preparation for going skydiving. We'll stick these links up in a little while. There's quite a lot of interesting online tutorials. Um, I've picked up on one from Colin here. Colin Scott Thompson is a rigger who's been working at Tampura Brava for many, many years. And recently he's been putting um, online tutorials. Some of them are very in-depth, but very informative pieces. The link I've popped here is for his first part on lines the different types of lines and their properties and uh, things to look for in a line set of your parachute. But there's also some quite interesting stuff on pilot chutes, uh, three ring release systems. Um, some of it is quite in depth, but some of it really does provide for a lot of information. And I've spent quite a lot of time during lockdown, got a few minutes to spare, just watch some or all of those. And it's very informative. So um, there's a couple of bits there that can help you out with your checks, use it as a checklist, and then lots of information um, about the equipment that you can learn. Packing, packing's really significant. Um, if we could pack well, we would have a massive um, improvement in our incident statistics. Uh, most incidents stem from some element of packing as involved, whether it was poor packing, whether it was a habitual, just progressively not getting uh, so, so, you know, getting complacent. I remember an incident two or three years ago, uh, a guy malfunctioned, cut away, used the reserve, landed perfectly safely, came back, couldn't quite understand why he'd had such a horrible opening. 
uh, when we looked at the equipment, both of the steering toggles were not set. His comment with a smile was, yeah, that's why it was odd when I packed it. I didn't set the brakes. So just complacency, we can just get used to the process and forget that we do sometimes need to measure what we're doing and, and maybe just take a step back and make sure that we're being quite clinical with our packing. As we get qualified, we can become slightly more blase with the packing. It's just a nuisance that gets in the way between landing and getting back in the aeroplane, but it can be important. I've picked on a, a link here from Performance Designs. They actually have a few packing videos and tutorials. I simply picked on them largely because they are the biggest manufacturer of canopies in, in the world, but there are quite a lot of packing pieces out there that can be very interesting. Um, and there's, you know, just little tips, even as a qualified jumper, I watched this one a, a couple of weeks ago in preparation for this. And there's a few little bits that you think, oh, that's still, that's a really good way of describing things or, or considering how we do, um, why we do these little bits for packing. So that's the real sort of kit side. Second side, thinking, gear up your thinking. Um, we will need to deal with emergencies. We've just seen the, the AGM, or I was watching the AGM. They were saying that the incident statistics this year, you know, there's, there's been very few incidents, but that's particularly because we've done very few jumps in the UK in the last 12 months. Looking at the review of Langer statistics, um, we actually had a higher incident rate um, in 2020 than we had in previous years. And without a doubt, um, much of that comes from a lack of currency. Um, it has a far more influential effect um, for some people than we would perhaps expect it to be. So when you're having a malfunction, um, it's not the time to be doubtful. It's certainly not the time to be questioning your actions or unsure. There's been a fairly worrying trend over the last few years of seeing people have very serious incidents on a global side or indeed fatalities where they've simply not responded to a malfunction in the way they were taught or the way you'd expect them, uh, the way it's universally expected people to respond. So we see people, what is often categorized as failing to deal with a malfunction in a timely or controlled fashion. They spend too long trying to resolve problems instead of realizing that it's a malfunction or when they simply come to follow their procedures they are incorrect in their choice of procedures or they fail on the physical side perhaps by pulling the handles in a non-sequential way or their technique is incorrect and they don't pull the cutaway pad for example adequately before moving on to the reserve so there are both physical aspects to the way we deal with a malfunction. And I'm not necessarily suggesting you jump around in your kitchen pulling handles, but when we run safety day every year, it's one of the biggest components. We go and have some fun, but use the practice areas and, and physically go through the, the actions. But we can certainly prepare our mental aspects and, and be absolutely confident in the way we would deal with malfunctions before we turn upon a drop zone for the first time, especially if our currency is missing a little bit. A lack of currency is really key. These are some comments from the USPA, the United States Parachute Association. So they're commenting on things like realistic and frequent emergency procedure practice on the ground will help jumpers perform their procedures correctly during an actual malfunction. If we practice on the ground and if we're effective and accurate with our practice, then we will be better and more effective in the air. And then the second one really comments on the, the mental aspects. Don't delay, don't think. If you're thinking or having to work your way through a problem, you're not prepared enough for that jump. If you give yourself a scenario on the ground, you should instantly know the result, the, the answer to that scenario, the way to uh, get yourself into a safe situation. I'll often teach people that aren't current experienced jumpers that, you know, a line over is relatively simple. You look at it, it's visually there, it's almost telling you quite simply what you need to do. 
a premature opening of your container, two canopies deploying, other scenarios that perhaps aren't quite so clear are the ones that you need to be sure of in your mind how you're going to respond before you go and get to a drop zone or before you jump out of an aeroplane. So have a think about um, how you want to respond to a malfunction and are you ready to make those what can be very time pressured and very important decisions um, when things go wrong. Just a couple of bits to help out there. Um, I listed Dan BC's um, footage. Uh, for those who, Dan BC is a multiple world champion who operates at a drop zone in America called Paris, probably one of the busiest drop zones in the world. Um, so there's someone who sees an awful lot of skydiving um, over many years. So he really talks about the concept of safety. You know, is there such thing as a safe person to go skydiving? Is there such thing as a safe skydive? Um, when we think about skydiving, we think we're getting a grasp of it. We can get the idea that we can do it safely because we'll be able to deal with problems. The reality is that when we go skydiving, we're a collection of often a lot of things that we can't necessarily influence. Uh, the weather, the wind conditions, the type of aeroplane, uh, the people that are also in the aeroplane with us could have a significant factor on how an emergency situation um, proceeds. So there's lots of stuff where we can consider our own risk um, and how we can maintain and reduce that risk. But as with any risk management, it's, it's impossible to eliminate risk. Risk will always be present. Um, it'll always be present when we go skydiving. And regardless of every effort that we make to mitigate those risks, there's always going to be an element of risk involved. So we need to be able to manage that by considering as much as we can before we get in an airplane. The second link there is a safety day video from me in 2019, where I simply did a malfunctions lecture, the theory part for really just angled towards a qualified and, and experienced jumper. So it's a little bit lengthy. It's about an hour and 20 minutes, but it does uh, remind us of the why we make decisions uh, and a look at various situations that occur. A typical malfunctions lecture for a student of that sort, the theory side might only take 20, 25 minutes, but I talk in more depth about the equipment that you are using compared to a typical student. So there's a couple of useful bits there. Um, certainly the safety day video might be one to have a good look at. There's a lot of qualified jumpers that haven't actually been involved in a malfunctions lecture for maybe many, many years, in some cases decades. So if you want to have a look at those, mine's not the only one. There are uh, a heap of malfunctions lectures uh, available out there on YouTube and other places. Um, but it's well worth just if you want some tips and guidance to have a look through those and and, and see what um, can help jog your memory before we start. All right, pretty much there. I'm going to wrap it up uh, as we've hit the half hour stage. I think this year has the capacity to be truly good for skydiving in the UK. Um, I know that many centres will be opening and certainly Skadavanga will be opening with the concept that we want to really, you know, make every jump count uh, and to make every opportunity with the weather to jump as much as we can. This probably means that we're going to see our equipment be asked to do more than it's ever done, potentially more jumps work harder for us. Um, we may well feel that we want to have less downtime when the opportunity to go skydiving is there. If it's good weather, we want to make use of that by jumping out of an airplane. We need to be able to have that capacity, that extra jumps that we want to make use of by making sure that we preempt that with our equipment. Do we need to change that kill line? Will it last as long as you know, well, it did last year, so surely it'll do next year. Last year just isn't going to compare, hopefully, to what we have coming. So 
it's a unique experience to know right now that there's really no point my kit being in date and ready to go in the next week or so it means i can feel good about taking it offline and having a really good haul through it and make sure that everything is super ready and then as i say you know currency is great currency we're all going to be under current when we start this year so let's hit it with a really um really fresh mind of uh learning what we need to learn and getting ourselves ready that is me done <laughs>